Hello and welcome to the Knights of Awakening. Kind of a special little gathering today uh, brought to you by Otori Miko, who has brought us together. Uh, and we're all from the Jedi Praxium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So today we're going to discuss martial arts and how it fits into and relates to kind of a little Q&A about martial arts and the Jedi path and, and the Jedi arts in, in general. Um, this is for Life Reflection Day, so if you're watching us there, uh, hi. I'm Justin, of course. You guys probably know me. Uh, let's uh, let's introduce everybody in the room, starting with uh, you, Charles. Hello, everyone. I'm Charles. I'm a co-host of Knights of Awakening, uh, former host of the Labyrinth, practicing mystic and martial artist, more on the uh, boxy, weapony side, but, you know, I study a little bit of everything. I'm sure Miko. Otori <clears throat> uh, Miko, formerly Dorigan Reclaw, um, one of the longest active members of the Jedi community. Uh, I've been a martial artist since I was about eight. Uh, it's been mostly empty hand stuff, but I have picked up several different weapons, including the sword, the staff, and firearms training because of a job I used to have a long time ago. Sir Bark, Michael? Certainly. Okay, so yes, my name is Michael Bark. Yes, I am a martial artist. I, I coach a form of Chinese boxing. It's called Chu Sao Lei Wing Chun Kyun, with my bad pronunciation, that's how I call it. Um, so that's a stand-up system, which means that we, you, we are predominantly or solely on our feet. Um, along with that, I, I'm a practitioner of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm a very bad practitioner, but I'm a practitioner of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is a system which works predominantly on the ground, not only, but predominantly on ground. And then I mix the two together through training um, MMA, mixed martial arts. So that's what I do. Oh, and when I can, I, I, I throw in a little weapon work as well. Weapons from my own system of, of Wing Chun, but also weapons from Filipino martial arts I train on occasion when I can. That's me. I would say a bad practitioner of any martial art is better than a non-practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Uh, so... We all came up with questions uh, to ask each other, and um, let me pull up these questions here. And I think, as customary, it was what I'm used to doing, handing the floor over to Charles. Charles, could you uh, give us your question and then uh, uh, kind of have us answer it at your leisure there, or just pick, pick who you want to answer it? Certainly. So I'm going to go left to right uh, on my screen here as I do this. So my question is, how do you incorporate the force into your martial arts? And how do you, how do your martial arts benefit your force work? So it's a double sided question. And as we're going left, to right, that means I put Justin on the hot spot first, since he's directly to my right on my screen here. So Justin, you know, how, how do you, how do you do this? Well, it, it, it's not much different than um, many of my practices where, uh, I'm incorporating the force, uh, which is almost everything that these days after 20 years, it just kind of becomes a habit that you put into everything. Uh, but as it relates to, to martial arts, um, of course, my goal is to connect and flow with the force, um, with my movements, my thoughts. Um, I do sort of like a moving meditation uh, where I focus my movements I focus on my movements, whether that's empty handed or with some kind of weapon or tool. Um, I then focus on seeing and feeling the force surrounding me and permeating me until my very movements, my very breathing uh, are, are enhanced by this connection in every way. I almost go into no mind sometimes. Um, and that's a question we'll get into later, maybe. But um, how are they benefit? How do I benefit from these? Um, well, basically... Uh yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's more of, 
um, how does how does the martial arts benefit your force work after that? So um, it's you know how do you incorporate it, but then how does how do your martial arts themselves benefit from it? Right. Do you notice? Do you notice them being more beneficial from it? Well, I was getting to that, but you yeah. yelled at me. <laughs> uh, they're benefited through that harmonious connection between myself and everything that's around me. You, uh, you get hyper-focused, you get hyper-aware, your strikes are more efficient and, and better on target and even stronger. Um, like I said, your mind is sharper, your mind is more focused. Um, and you are operating in like this complete state of calm. If, if you find that, that, that harmony between your, your mind, your body and your, your spirit, Martial arts is a good way to do that because it's kind of forcing you to work together. Because if you're not, then you're going to fall or trip or uh, get punched in the face if you're sparring, uh, which nobody likes doing. Nobody likes getting hit in the face. Uh, but it enhances it, it enhances what you're doing because you have that hyper awareness. Nothing else kind of matters at that moment. All righty. The next person up would be Miko. Miko, how do you incorporate the force into your martial arts and how do your martial arts benefit from your force work? Hmm. How do I incorporate the force into my martial arts? Um, so that, that has a little bit of a backstory to it. When I first started on the path a really long time ago, it was, it was specifically to add energy work to my martial arts. I, didn't, I, I was in a not so happy place and I needed those martial arts to be as efficient as possible and anything I could add to them, I would. So very early on the path. And obviously that's been a long time ago and things have changed, but still, um, <clears throat> I studied a lot of, of hard and soft combative Qigong techniques to increase not just the destructive potential of the techniques, but the protective potential and, and how to make them more fluid and how to make your stances more stable and how to move faster. And there's a lot of different little ways that I incorporate the force into my martial arts training throughout the years. And it's just become to a point where it's all one practice now with a lot of little bitty pieces. So how has my force work, benefited from my martial arts was that the other side of the question yes all right. yes all right so how's my force work benefited from my well the martial arts have, have because of the the all-encompassing nature of this type of training it helps to it helps you to gain that that no mind like focus that justin was talking about and that is paramount in breaking levels breaking plateaus when you're you're training energy work the, the ability to drop into a state of true fluidity and become more aligned with the force and its flow and its will and its desire and its dynamics and <clears throat> what you're supposed to be doing requires this kind of moving flow that, yes, you can get it other places, but I have not seen anywhere get it this efficiently. So that's, that's me. Excellent. So, Michael, Mr. Bark. Um, okay, how do you I, incorporate the force into your martial arts and how do your martial arts benefit your force work? Okay, I have the benefit here of being the last person, so I can listen to the other two answers so far. And of course, Charles, but, you need to answer you need to answer your own question too. Yeah. That's second, second to last, second to last. I don't get I don't get taken off the spot here, I don't think. <laughs> well, um, that's a good question. Um, I would say that. Perhaps my approach is slight. My ideas and my approach concerning the force is slightly different from others, but that, that, that's beside the point. Um, I don't think I, I don't concentrate so much on how the force benefits my martial arts. In, instead, I I, con I concentrate on the whole system. For example, um, um, the the, the stru structure. The structure, the the um, so when we punch, we we punch with structure. We we punch with a dynamic structure. We we punch with the connection to the ground. And when I'm receiving things, I I receive things into the ground. 
So we have that. And then there's other aspects of our system. Um, for example, the diet, the diet, this, this kind of help, this helps if you like our personal force, all of this helps our health and vitality. So the idea of fasting and about certain foods which we can eat or which we should eat and certain foods which we shouldn't eat. And then there's the other aspect of our art and the, the people I train with, so, such as meditation. Meditation is a very large part of, of, of my art, of my life. And so that too would feed into what, we, what you would consider um, force training aspects of the force. So all of that combined. So it's not just one thing, but it's everything combined. The physical aspects of lining your body up Getting the, getting the correct mechanics, using the fascia, as we now like to say, using the fascia, using our breathing. Of course, like all Chinese martial arts, most Chinese martial arts, we have um, some emphasis on breathing, which is often called qigong. So all of these aspects combined, combined certainly, you could consider as false work. Stop. Okay. Um, for myself, I'll answer, how do I uh, incorporate the force into my martial arts first? Um, for me, it is necessary because I am not someone who has a natural inclination towards combat. I actually was a pacifist in my very early years. It's also necessary because I don't have a self-defense, self-preservation instinct from not to keep from being hit. When I connect to the force, I have an awareness and a oneness with things time gives me a bit of a slowdown, I can react, I can block, I can move out the way, I can counter strike. Without that, for me, because of my natural instincts, I'm a heavy bag that punches back, very literally sometimes. And if I'm not in a good flow state with it, if I'm not in a good force state, I very much very quickly realized that I was just trading punches. Or in the case of weapons art forms, I was throwing lots of attacks in hopes of landing a hit. And while neither of those is terrible. They're also very dangerous, very non-self-preservationist methods of fighting and conflict resolution. When I connect to the force, that awareness allows me to, as I, as I always told my sparring partners and I always tell them to this day, it lets a guy like me compete at their level and to get to their level to where I can equal or get a little bit above where they're at sometimes. Now, how does, how does the martial arts benefit my force work? Well, the biggest thing with force work I've ever noticed for anyone, anywhere, is this proving it to yourself that it works. And when you have just stepped past a sword swing, that you know you didn't have the reaction time to do so before and hit a guy and he feels like he was standing still, you start to have an evidence that is undeniable. When you hit a man with a light palm strike and knock him to the ground, it gives you something that shows you that you did more than what you would have done with just your bare hands, with just the weapon that was in them, or just your normal movement. It proves to you the, the essence of the force's reality in a way that gets past the doubting mind. And that is one of the most valuable parts of practicing the force within the martial arts. That part of you that says, I know this is here and I'm connecting to it, but how real is it? Suddenly turns into, well, I know I can launch a guy 30 feet back well, not quite 30, but 10 feet back with a palm strike. Uh, and I know 10 feet because I remember doing it to a very sturdy built friend of mine. And I know I can launch a guy back 10 feet back with a light palm strike. I can't doubt this anymore. I can't sit there and say, is this in my head? It's not in my head. It's in my hand. It's in my body. It's in them. So that's where those benefits come in, which means that we're swinging back over to the man who's on fire for the next part to lead us to our next person, Justin. So, so my answer, Michael's answer, and Miko's answer were so, and Charles, were, our answers were so kind of different regarding martial arts. I have to ask real quick and, and, and just make this a quick response. What is, what is martial arts? Because it seems like they're different to each of us. Michael, we'll start with you. Uh, plainly, what, what is martial arts? So that way we can kind of set a, set a, a, a benchmark here for everyone to follow. Okay. So martial arts is the art of combat, it, it, it's violence. It's, for, for us as a modern practitioner, it's health and vitality and strength. And for our opponents, it's control and destruction. 
That's my version of it. Miko? The martial arts, individually, they are, again, they are acts of war. They are using the body or they're using the body to destroy someone else. Now, you may have a weapon in the way, but you are still manipulating that weapon. We made a joke about the, the, the best weapon being a tank, and that's not a martial art. That's just a superior art, and I understand that. That blows stuff up. <clears throat> but that doesn't, make, that doesn't keep it in within this definition of physical body-to-body -body combat arts. Now, <clears throat> on the physical, that's, all, that's what they are. They're training their health, and they are break something off in somebody else if need be. But there's a spiritual component to it, and there's a lot of mental training involved in that. And so it's, it's not just combat art. I mean, I can go train to just beat the snot out of somebody, but that doesn't give you the same benefit as the meditative motion and the, the flow states that you get through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say proper, and through, through most Eastern martial arts practice, because that's where it is most commonly seen. Chuck? Um, I, I want to emphasize the word art within the word martial arts. We all, we, we, you know, Michael and Otori have hit on the, the martial part and uh, somewhat the art part. It is, it is more than just the skill set. It is the mind frame. It is the understanding that this is like an art form, like painting a picture. You're going to do it in a different way than everyone else does but you're also gonna do it within ways that other people have done before to help you get started, to help you understand it. It's an awareness of the self, the world around you, and the person that you are in conflict with so that all become, the whole of all becomes one so that you can resolve that conflict in hopefully the least violent way possible and escalating up to the way that makes sure that you walk out of it alive. And that is, an, that is more art than it is simply skill. Anyone can learn to throw a really hard punch. It takes a lot more to have the ability to make decisions in the moment of flow within that. That's where we get the art within the martial art. Uh, and there's always a very heavy focus on it being combat oriented. And I believe that's important. Um, for me, everything I do has to be practical. And I would say for everyone in this room, that's the same way. And I would say that we would all agree also, though, that in that practicality, we're always exploring the deeper question behind it. Even in something like boxing, it's a very simple art form, but there is a flow state in it. If a boxer shadow boxes and things like that, um, you often see in the modern era, people get rid of some of the more esoteric components of our, of our uh, Western arts to the detriment of those art forms, sadly. Yeah, qu quickly for me, it's it, it's a combination of everything you guys said. Of course, um, I, I look at it, and maybe this is a modern understanding of it, um, because we don't have battlefields full of people punching each other in the face anymore, or stabbing each other with spears and stuff. Uh, our, our our warfare is more like booms and blows, explosions and drones, and we don't. So for me, it, it's more of like a harmonious marriage between. Uh, mind, body, spirit, but also uh, finding and understanding principles, building character, understanding philosophy. There's a lot of different things that go into martial arts, which is which is why I love martial arts. I love learning about it, studying. I don't always practice it all or all of them, but when you look at them, each of them kind of excel in certain parts. Some are more combat oriented, but others are more uh, mind and, and, and spirit focused, uh, others are more heavily philo uh, philosophical, you know, uh, Kuxel one was very, uh, philosophical more so than, you know, combat heavy. Um, in fact, there was a time where if, uh, Kuxel one practitioners weren't even allowed to participate in like national tournaments and stuff, because that was against what they kind of were going for. But so I just wanted to, to ask that of you guys, because um, I think it helps people understand our answers to these questions. And so our next question is from Michael. 
Okay, thank you. So my question is how, if I remember my question, um, the aspects of light and dark, how do the notions of light and dark influence your training in martial arts? Stop. And I suppose I should choose someone. Okay. So Charles, if you would, please. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so for me, light and dark are the core of my ideas of martial arts because everything comes down to light and dark. And I want to preface this with light and dark is always situational to what you're talking about. Light and dark, yin and yang, when you're talking about morality, is very different from light and dark when you're talking about spirituality. It's very different from situational. It's very different from the yin and yang of the balance and the harmony of the universe itself. So with that first, I recognize that in order to ensure the light, which is the survivability, the positive aspects of the world, the nature of who I am and how I, how I fight, how I think, how I engage in conflict has to be very dark. That I am one of those people due to that lower reaction time that I mentioned earlier, I can utilize it with the force, I can amplify it. But if I rely on it to avoid, 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 and I focus on that concept of light in terms of morality and in a sense, dark in terms of you know, using that, that less seen, less understood aspect, that hidden aspect of movement, that I, in essence, will eventually get pummeled to death, uh, very literally. Instead, I recognize that I must embrace a darker aspect in conflict and cause harm to stop my opponent before they can hurt me. I am never going to disarm someone through a dozen deflections and a throw. It's not how I'm built. It's not how my brain works. And it's not how my body works. However, in that, I also bring with that the active component of light, recognizing that I'm ending this before they can kill me, and hopefully before I have to hurt them so bad that I kill them. You know, a kidney blow will mess someone up. It might put them in the hospital. Uh, in fact, if, if I'm doing it without gloves on, it very much will put them in the hospital. But it will only put them in the hospital. It won't be a death blow, a, a strike to the ear with the flat of the palm is a dark thing. You're going to injure this person severely, but it is also better than trading blows with them until they drop and are effectively removed from life itself. I, I take light and dark to mean a give and take. And I recognize that that also means that I can't simply go on the raw offensive when I fight within the marshal, but I also recognize that I need to balance out my reason for entering a conflict. If I'm in a conflict and I have to use this, I have to ask myself, am I doing this because I'm protecting myself or other people? Or am I doing this because there is a part of me that is an animal like all other people that seriously wants to hurt the other person because how dare they enter conflict with me? And I have to be able to answer that question in that moment and in that practice. So within my training methods, I train the give and take. I try to not just go full active, which in a sense is light, very, very, very bright, very shiny, very forward. And I try to remember the darker aspect of combat in the form of evasion and illusion and trickery. And I also must remember the darker intent of combat, of harm, as well as the lighter, con the lighter part of conflict, which is recognizing that if I just try to trade blows with this person indefinitely without stopping them early, I am more likely to kill. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Authority, please. What's your take? So the light and dark of combat. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna reference this more often as yin and yang because. I don't necessarily like the connotations of light and dark because you know, on a cosmic sense, dark things are needed. And so keeping this, this negative stereotype that our community very plainly has with that word. 
I, I'm, I'm going to try and just not use that at the moment. Um, <clears throat> so balancing the yin and yang in the way I train is always remembering that the very violent, very external arts are very young. They're very dark. They're very destructive. They're very active. And when you balance this with the meditative, the internal, the, the passive, even the energetically based health uh, centered arts like Tai Chi Chuan, Bagwazang, things like that, um, the, the internal is the yin. And so for the longest time, I didn't practice this way because as I've mentioned many times before, I grew up in a really bad situation and my martial training was legitimately aimed at destruction of another human being. It was a focus. It got me to where I am. I'm not ashamed of what it was. It never got to that point. And I'm, I'm proud that I can say that. But <clears throat> the point is that I used to study all of the dark that of combat. And combat as a concept, when you look at it from this path, of you have like the warrior and the mystic aspects of it. The warrior aspect of it is the young. It is the dark. And the mystic aspect is the internal, the questing, the, the passivity, the enlightenment. It is the yin. So the further you step out from this picture, the definitions of yin and yang change, just like Charles was saying. The definitions of light and dark are very subjective. So if, if you're talking about a direct application, um, looking at the light and dark of it, the light is... Or, or the dark is this this destructive application where you end up dislocating or breaking the limb. Um, the light aspect of it is modifying it to where you don't have to. You just lock it and put them on the ground and disable them without doing any permanent damage. The move doesn't change as far as what you're training just empty-handed or basic and you know partner drills or whatnot because you're not trying to break your partner into pieces that runs you out of partners really really fast so you you, you focus on the yin there and you, you you work on this but because you're in this state of yin you have to focus in the back on the yang or the the more severe moments when you're going to have to use this as a destructive art you're not going to be ready for it so Light and dark in training should be every second of training, even to the point of overtraining is destructive to the body. And that would, by its definition, be very young, not very in, would be very healthy. And you can train yourself into a hole that you can't crawl back out of. You can train yourself until you break into pieces and you can't do anything. And at that point, all that training goes right down the shitter. And it's it's absolutely pointless at that point. So remembering the, the concepts of light and dark as the pieces of balance is you always have to maintain this sense of balance in every aspect of your training, no matter how small or how big. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Justin, what are your thoughts? I don't like the word light and dark either. That's why I, I, I strive to always... Uh, look at things, especially through the view of the forest, through Ash Bogan, only because it helps me understand two things, harmony and disharmony. Everything that we do, every thought, every single word, everything we write, everything we read, everything we, everything has the potential to be bad or dark or light or whatever, everything. Um, for me, it comes comes back to intent so when i thought about this question uh it takes me to the idea of intent and as we as we think about self-defense martial arts uh you know you're literally taught uh techniques that can be deadly like you learn to kill people in a way uh with your bare hands even you know um even even techniques that aren't necessarily meant to to uh cause death um like michael you do uh jujitsu uh you could you could uh cripple somebody for life you know with with those techniques very easily so when i think about it i think about intent now like for example in the army i was taught to i was taught techniques that were designed to stop your uh enemy to to wreck another human being 
period. Just wreck them, stop them, incapacitate them, uh, up to and including death. Um, maiming, dislocating, breaking, those are, you know, those are even better because then they take two people off the battlefield, right? Um, I still practice those techniques. I don't practice them on people, and I hope I never have to use them on people, but I still practice them. Uh, as, a re as a responder, I've learned and, and used and practiced many times, more times than I can count, I've used these techniques to where you learn how to control people through pain compliance. You learn to manipulate their body in ways that doesn't feel great, and it could cause serious, lasting, permanent damage to them. So the goal, of course, for me as a martial artist or as a practitioner of combat arts, probably a better way to say it, um, is to do the least amount of damage possible. That's, that's where the, the quote unquote light comes in for me, um, is to use these techniques that could be misused. And as uh, Otori said, uh, you know, if, you, if someone wants to use these uh, incorrectly and wrongly and um, darkly, they can. It's just a matter of choice and intent at that point so you know but again also uh just because my intent is to do the least amount of damage amount uh, amount of damage possible doesn't mean it always happens that way too uh people still get hurt i I've, I've been hurt many times so when i think about light and darkness context I, I i like to go back to ashla where i am in harmony with not only myself i try to be in harmony with my my opponent or um, and with the surroundings, because that's, that's where I'm at my best. So, um, at the end of the day, this question kind of brings me to, is what I'm doing necessary? Is it the right thing to do? Um, will I have to justify my actions or will the actions need no justification because I was completely in the right? So that's, that's kind of how I, I look at self-defense and martial arts or the use of martial arts. Um, in the context of right and wrong and light and dark is do you need to be justified or were your actions already justified without uh, needing anything? So. Excellent. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for those responses. Um, I don't know what to say now, <laughs> but yes, yes, I can. I, I, I agree and I appreciate everything that you said. Um, to echo something that I said near the beginning of our conversation about martial arts. So this is one aspect I have here, whereas I train martial arts to become stronger, to become more vital, to become healthier for my own longevity and for the, the people I train with. However, when I am when I'm in an altercation, when I'm fighting, let's say not fighting on the street because that doesn't really happen. That doesn't happen in my society so much. When, when, I'm, when I'm sparring, when, I, when I'm in a competition, then obviously I'm protecting my health and I am trying to damage the health of the person within limits that I am fighting against. So obviously that's restricted by the rules, depending on what rule set we are using. Um, but in a reality situation, it is my health, my protection, or those, those people I'm protecting and destroying in whatever way I can, the, the aggressor. So there we have that, that kind of that light and dark situation. Um, Yes, and obviously the violence needs to be, in my head, justified. It needs to be justified. My level of violence needs to be justified. If I enter a competition, the rules justify that, provide that level of violence that I can use. If I am on a street, my actions need to be justified. Um, and maybe I'll need to justify them to a court afterwards. But I need to, it needs to, it needs to have a sense of justification. Um, the other way we can look at it um, in my training is the order, let's use my hands here, order and chaos. So that chaos is that darkness and that order is the light. 
So in my training, I can't have my training too ordered. I can't simply do form. I can't simply do prearranged partner drills. There needs to be the chaos. So there has to be the balance. And by chaos in training, I mean, we need to put our gloves on. We need to spar in whatever sparring games we devise for that day with whatever rules we devise for that particular session. But we need to spar. So we have, we have the order, the set, you do this, I do that, the forms, etc., And then we have the chaos. So, that, so that's, that's, that's the balance that I see within my training. Okay, so I guess it's my turn to ask my question. And my question was, what are the physical, mental, spiritual benefits of, of a martial arts practice? And I will start with Mr. Michael Bark. Okay. Um, well, I don't, I, I don't tend to divide. I don't, I, I, I don't tend to do that in my practice or with the guys that, that I train. Um, but I can certainly say, yes, there are benefits. There are benefits, certainly. So obviously, physically, we understand the benefits physically or what a good training system can can give you we are we are more vital we are stronger etc cetera, etc cetera. if we have a good club if we have a good school then these things are almost guaranteed however there is a dark side to this as well because when we train too much or if we enter certain competitions we will get damaged okay so there is there is that so yes martial arts are good to a certain extent. <laughs> okay, mental. Mental characteristics, yes, certainly. Okay, because we have study, because martial art isn't just a physical thing, it is a mental thing. So we have mental clarity. So when we're talking about meditation, when we talk about doing forms, when we talk about um, concentrating mindfulness, concentrating on um, uh, the motion and only the motion, so, so yes, mental, mental benefits too, certainly. When it comes to physical, physical, I'm uh, sorry, spiritual, spiritual for me is a combination of the two. I, 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 I don't have a thing. I don't, I don't have a system where I say physical, mental, spiritual. I see spiritual as the combination of everything. So yes, benefits there certainly are providing you train correctly stop so one kind of begets the other for you okay um me uh charles how i'll i'll ask it a little bit different this way uh, because it's kind of an obvious answer of course it makes us stronger of course it makes us smarter and sharper of course there are some spiritual benefits for for most people uh for you personally what what has what benefits physical, mental, and spiritual have you found uh, with your practice? Well, physical, it gives me a reason to get up and move. We live in a sedentary lifestyle. Um, as a doo-doo practices mysticism on a professional level, my job does not have me moving around a lot. Like no matter how many hand symbols I draw or how many uh, sigils I, I put down to paper or chalkboard, uh, none of that's burning any significant amount. There's not of a lot of there's not a lot of jumping jacks and uh, sit ups. <laughs> not not normally. Uh, not normally. Not unless I've got an overload of clients that month and I'm frustrated and I'm hopping up and down in frustration, which does happen sometimes. But ideally, um, for me, the physical benefit it gives me a reason to be moving. I am not someone who can just lift weights for the joy of lifting weights. I have to lift weights towards a goal. And if I know that I'm trying to increase my punching strength or my ability to take a hit, uh, weightlifting suddenly has a purpose. But moreover, the movements themselves are active. You cannot help but burn some calories and strengthen some limbs and do just a little bit better than you did the day before in any martial art or any combative art. 
as for the mental, the mental is one that I think a lot of people overlook. There is a, a focusing that happens. You are fully engaged in what you're doing in the mental, especially once you get into sparring and drills, because if you are not, you will have a corrective measure that will, that will be implemented instantaneously, often across your nose, uh, that will bring you back to a hyper level of focus. You will, you, will, you will be aware. You will be aware of your nose. You will be aware of what hit your nose. And the next thing that happens, you will be far more focused in on. I am one of those people that outside of my meditation states and outside of purposefully taking on a hyper state of focus, don't have it. If I enter a state, I have it, but I need a reason to enter it. And there is no better reason than, you know what? I don't want to be hitting the nose today. I don't want to be hitting the ribs or, hey, I would like to hit this guy instead. Um, be that with a weapon, even if it is a foam padded weapon for practice, or if it is a flexible weapon like Shanai, there, there is an incentive. Getting smacked across the wrist with a ruler reminds you to be aware. It is, a, it is a mental sharpening, and then that mental sharpness will then parlay into everything else. As for the spiritual, part of that is incorporating the force into it for me, but part of it's also the peace that comes from the repetition. There is a level of peace that comes from the practice, but there's also a, a spiritual level of peace of knowing that you don't have to necessarily be super combative even if you have to enter a conflict and what i mean by that is when you enter a conflict with someone if you believe you're about to enter combat okay let's make that the difference between conflict and combat and you have no tools then you must now fight and scrape and bite and claw for your survival if you have no other tools and that creates a spiritual disharmony that means every conflict that could escalate into into a fight, into combat, now places you on a survival edge. When you have those tools, you are in spiritual harmony with your world because you know you have more than just the animal side to rely on. You can make choices. And that goes for every martial art. It, whether it is I'm going to throw this guy or I know where to hit him to stop him, or even I know how to get my arms in the way of an incoming punch, or I know how to sidestep a kick. This spiritual benefit of not having to be in a life or death mode while still being in a life or death engagement, so that you have choices, you have, you have a level of harmony built in because you have a readiness. It, it, it allows every conflict you enter into to be so much less because you know you're going to walk out of it, or at least you know have you know you have the tools to walk out of it. That would be that. But I also want to hit on on this the training itself, especially traditional martial arts. Because I know I threw boxing out there, but I also do a smattering of about just about everything else I can get a hold of, uh, including some things like Wing Chun and a little bit of karate and a little bit of well a whole lot of Qigong. There is something in the movements because the way they line the body up and the biomechanics of it promotes a better energy flow because you are utilizing more of your body than you normally would. And there is there is an innate spiritual benefit right then and there that is often missed when we discuss these things. And I, I will finish it with that. I think mainly because they they have to almost be experienced to understand like the force you can't just tell people what it is you know uh oh tori same question to you so what physical benefit physical benefits that i've gotten well like charles said it gives me an excuse to get up off my butt um for a very long time i had a very seriously just sedentary job i don't have that now but and that's it's awesome and i wouldn't be able to do the job i do now if it hadn't been for the years of martial arts training to get me to a physical condition point where i could handle it okay it, it keeps the body strong it keeps the body healthy uh keeps weight coming off 
because that last very sedentary job blew me up to way larger than I ever want to admit. And I've lost almost half of the body weight by now. I'm close to half that size. And that's outstanding for me personally. Um, mentally, it gives you it gives you the ability to focus to such an extent that you lose focus of everything. Um, it's it's the the Dallas principle of Wu Wei, the the effortless action, and that ties directly into the the states of the combative mind and Japanese arts of zanshin of remaining focus, fudoshin of indomitable focus, and wushin of empty mind. And all three of those exi exist almost simultaneously at the right times. You you know where everything is. There is nothing that can break your focus, but you're not focusing on anything. And that state of being, that's, that's really, really hard to put into words for people to understand. And pretty much the only way you really get to know it is to do it. But that's, that's the mental side of it. The spiritual side of it is it gives you the ability to find that empty, truly peaceful center. Reminds me of an episode of uh, Dragon Ball Z where Gohan's teaching Videl how to fly. And he says, you have to find this, this center of your being where everything is just total peace. And he's got his hands up and this little itty bitty spark pops up in the middle of it. And that, outside of the visual and then the awesome ability that it would be of learning how to fly, that is exactly how that, that works. The martial arts help you to find that sense of your center, that sense of pristine, total oneness with the force with the universe with everything and there it's it's fleeting at first and it can get to be longer it can get to be shorter it can it can get to be focused it can get to be very distracting because of that level of connection is indescribable to the human mind because we just we're not really built for it but the exposure to it helps us it helps us in all ways it helps in our training and it helps in our evolution as, as a species so that would be my answer. Yeah. Uh, it, again, it's something that has to be experienced. It's a, a, nearly impossible. I, I, I watch these, these uh, teachers give classes, and sometimes it blows me away. Uh, of course, I, I attended your class at the Praxium, um, and the concepts we were exploring, it, it, it amazed me how you were able to find some words to describe it. Because a lot of what we talk about, a lot of what we try to e explain is something that has to be purely experienced. It's almost impossible to talk about it, which kind of sucks because we want to share this stuff with the world. and <laughs> It's impossible, almost not impossible, but man, it's hard to find the words to um, to express it. Uh, my answer to this was was pretty. I mean, all three of you hit pretty much where I was at. You know, of course, it made me help. It, it, it made me stronger. It made me more uh flexible it made me more capable it made me more confident physically um it gave me a way to practice practical and useful movements ten thousand times you know it, it it like it also got me off the couch it got me away from uh other things that that probably weren't healthy um it made me sharper Maybe more mindful. Um, it kind of comes back to harmony. Ultimately, it made me more harmonious within myself, um, mentally, spiritually, physically. Um, and it, it uh, made me more kind and compassionate. When you learn how to do things that aren't kind and compassionate and you choose to be more kind and compassionate, it makes you a better person. You know, kindness by any measure is still kindness. And oftentimes we learn this. At least I had to learn this by learning how to destroy things. I learned how to be better. I learned how to take care of things more better and take care of people and take care of myself. So, um, so that leaves us with one final question. And I will turn it over to you, Mr. Ortori. There's a prevailing statement within the mythos of the Jedi path, and it is the concept of the Jedi's weapon. Now, not looking at the fictional weapon because it's a piece of 
technology that doesn't exist and cannot exist with the technology we have. Taking it from the perspective of practical martial arts training, I would like to know, every one of you, what your ideal Jedi weapon would be. Because as a, as a knight of the Jedi path, there is always this, this concept of the ability or necessity of physically interacting, socially interacting, interacting into a negative situation that could ultimately lead to a violent confrontation. But readying yourself for the violent confrontation helps you to ready yourself for any nonviolent confrontation before that. If you're, if you're not scared to get in a violent confrontation, you're not scared to stand up and tell somebody they're being uh, wrong. We'll just say wrong. There's a bunch of ways people can be wrong. So that weapon becomes as much a part of the physical training as it does the psychological training. So I'd like to know each of you, which, what do you think is the, the premier Jedi weapon? And with that, I would like to send this to Charles first. So Charles. Well, my answer is a dual answer, but I will explain it quickly and, and concisely. It is both the Boken and the walking stick. And the reason for this is that the walking stick is the hidden weapon. It is totally harmless as it should be until it is necessary to be harmful. It is concealable in the sense that you can take it out in the public and it is seen and no one sees it as a threat. If you have any injuries, it becomes a great benefit. It's a lever, it's a tool. It's all of the great things that any good stick is but it is also one of the most effective bludgeoning tools that you can carry easily anywhere. The reason for the Boken within that is because everything you learn to do with a Boken translates into a walking stick perfectly with zero shifts and changes. Literally, they are the same thing with a slight shape form change, but the Boken retains the essence of the concept of the sword. And there are two concepts of the sword, the life-giving sword and the life-taking sword. And in that essence, the symbology of the sword is retained within the ideal of the Boken. That we have the power to protect life, the power to take life, and that in that, any action that is taking life should be protecting life. And when I say taking life, I don't mean necessarily just killing someone. If you shatter a man's hand, you've taken part of his life. He will never use that hand the same way again. And you should be very certain that you are giving someone else life, yourself or another person with that action. This should not be for pride or ego or arrogance, but it should be protecting life, giving life when you take from someone else's. Fantastic answer, my friend, absolutely. Um, Justin, I'd like to hear your answer, please, sir. I protect the weak and defend the innocent. Wherever I go, whatever I do. That is one of the nightly precepts that I, I, I share and I teach and I, I carry with me. Uh, Charles and I have been working on a, a, a series of shows about the precepts and um, today, no, maybe next week you'll hear uh, our discussion of based on this, but this is kind of the pivotal thing. I protect the weak and defend the innocent wherever I go, whatever I do. Well, how do we protect people, right? Um, ultimately, uh, a, a knight or Jedi who practices martial arts, they should be the weapon. Their minds should be sharp and easily focused. Their body should be strong, flexible, trained and practiced, and their spirit should always be noble and kind. Anything in their hands, whether that be a, a, a stick or a sword or a gun or whatever, should be an extension of these things, the things I just mentioned. If we're talking about um, an object, uh, a knight or a Jedi would use a self-defense weapon, I would always go to the shield. That is probably the, the, the uh, that's probably the physical manifestation of a knight because we defend the weak and, and protect the innocent. However, it's, it's a little weird to carry around this big old shield, right? Unless you're all spangly uh, and in a comic book. But uh, no, so I, I, I would say if we're talking about uh, an object 
that we would use as, as a defense weapon. Then I have to, uh, considering the legalities of most places, the practicalities uh, and ease of, ease of use and the ease of training, um, I would have to go with some kind of staff, like Charles said, like a walking stick or a staff. I think that would fit the bill nicely because you get to that, that, that becomes an extension of your principles and that becomes an extension of your morals and it becomes an extension of your path and your, your ideals and all these things. So, um, because it can easily be whatever you want it to be and it's hides in plain sight. So. Very nice to put, I appreciate that. The shield is a, is a fantastic answer, but you're right. It's, they're a little cumbersome unless you're wearing the blue hoodie spandex thing. <clears throat> All right, Mike. So this, this leaves you. Um, and, and I want to put just a little caveat here because Char uh, because Charles and Justin did bring this up. If the legality wasn't as much of an issue because uh, legality is going to limit us to this much. And there's uh, a lot more than that. So if the legality wasn't an issue, if that changes your answer, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, if okay. it doesn't, then that's great. But what, what, in your opinion, is the premier Jedi weapon? Okay, so firstly, let me take legality as an issue, firstly. So it is an issue. We are from different places. I am living in Italy. It's a completely different culture. And the laws are very different from, from where you guys are, are coming from. So I would really, really have to reflect what has been so far said. So walking stick is an ideal thing that I can walk with. And I sometimes do when I'm in the mountains, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, walking stick, super duper. I, I really like that. And, and, and I like to train. I like to train with short sticks and a walking stick, not as a system, but just within, within my home training. And there's also another weapon that's even smaller, which I always carry, except I don't have it now. And that is, and that is a pen, uh, as you see. I'm, I'm sure you've seen them, the emergency pens, self-defense pens, um, advertised in different ways. So I always have this on me. In my country, it isn't, it isn't sharp. I can't have a sharp pen. I know you can buy them with points on, et cetera, et cetera. I can't walk with that, okay? That, that is classed as um, a weapon that I can't walk with. However, what I walk with, my pen is a glass breaker. So I have that little metal, metal ball at the end of it. So I use that. I use that in my training. I use that, I'm a school teacher. So I use that at work when I'm writing. I use that all of the time. So, so that is the weapon, let's say the, the, um, the run of the mill weapon, the, uh, the, the, the run of the mill, the, the weapon that I'm in most contact with on a daily basis is, is my pen. Now, obviously we also know that the pen can be used as a weapon in any ways. Words can be used as a weapon in another sense too. So that's, but that's another aspect. Okay, let's talk about in a non, where there is no law. Oh my gosh, I haven't even thought about that. Uh, so what weapon would I love to carry with me? Okay, yeah, okay, lightsaber. Yeah, please, that'd be pretty damn cool if I had a lightsaber. Okay, but considering physics, et cetera, et cetera, if we have to consider that. Um, okay, would I walk around with a sword? Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But also, also the stick. I mean, I train with a stick more often and I train with a knife. So stick and knife is what I train with. I train with a long pole. I train with a, with a short pole. So I train with a medium pole. So I'm used to training with a pole. However, if we are in a society that is, um, where there are no restrictions, a society where every other person has a sword or two swords at their sides. Would I choose a, would I choose a, a staff? Yeah. I don't know, man. 
I don't know. I'm not sure. The yeah. sword can kill. The sword can removing heal. legality. Removing legality does kind of make that a much messier question. So <laughs> I, I, I would like to, I would like to insert that Michael Bart just answered Otori Miko that the pin is mightier than the sword. Yes. When asked about weaponry, I would just like to put that on the record for the rest of eternity. And I love <laughs> that. Eternity. That, Thanks, guys. That, that, that you did that. I love that you did that. <laughs> Okay, let's turn the question back to the questioner. Please, sir, what is what are your thoughts? The premier Jedi weapon. Well, I mean, there is the obvious statement of the Jedi has to be the weapon. <clears throat> but that's that's not why this question was aimed that way. Um, the premier weapon of a Jedi is one that again, looking at a physical weapon is one that demonstrates a statement of readiness to act, willingness to act, but peace in action. It should not be something that is overly de just demoralizing. It shouldn't be something that just it's big and scary, like a shotgun or rocket launch or anything crazy like that. <clears throat> and it should not be something that is simply devised for war. And so no matter how many of them are hanging on the wall, I'm not going to say sword. I am going to say staff because a staff is it is one of these single most versatile weapons that you can train because you can find anything to emulate a staff if you were in a defensive situation that required it. Like I personally like to train a five foot staff because that's about how long a shovel is, it's about how long a broom is. If I'm in a situation where I'm out and about and I'm in a building and I need it, there's a possibility, there's a pretty high possibility there's something in two steps for me that I can use like a five foot staff. I could technically use it like a six foot staff, but if I'm used to a six foot staff and I swing something that's four and a half foot and I miss, no. So <clears throat> I like to keep it in a, a relatively generally useful um, distance and length range. But the weapon has no edge. It has no destructive capability. Yes, there is a potential for anything to be misused to a lethal end. But this is never something about a lethal end. This is, this is something to help you carry water. This is something to help you climb a, a hill or prop open a door so that you can get through it or dig up a a root, a medicinal root, so that you don't die. I mean, this is this is the oldest tool, and they grow naturally from the ground. It takes very little forging to, to make a good staff, and so it makes them eminently replaceable, but they're also extremely durable in what they are. So I, I feel that this makes its existence premier for the Jedi path because it is natural and because it is purely visually defensive and because it is not a super imposing site just to be there yes you can wield it to be an imposing thing but again that's the misuse of anything and to that end i've actually taken since the the gathering in august to forming um the jedi staff form i noticed something while we were there that everybody was using their symbols of the martial aspect to put it very politely <clears throat> in ways to fulfill this, this ingrained connection that so many of us have with the combative aspect in the Jedi Knight. It's the knightly part of that, usually. <clears throat> but due to legality, even though I did take it out of the question for Michael, um, due to legality, due to versatility, there, there are countries where this is the, uh, the staff is the only weapon that I've listed that you can actually get because it's a stick that grows out of the ground and it's kind of hard to stop it. It's really difficult to say, don't cut that limb off and hit somebody with it because you can't. So because of that, I've, I've taken to devising the Jedi staff form and you can find that at jediarts.site. I'll make sure there's a link posted at some point in the description or maybe flash across the bottom of the screen here when we show this, I don't know. We'll see. Um, the Jedi Staff short form is up. There are some basics up. I'm working on standing and seated uh, breath work, similar to Qigong. 
and I will also be doing another another long staff form, a short staff, at least one short staff form, and an empty hand form. And they're all presented in a very Tai Chi meditative way, but they all have every move has an application to it. So you're not just pretty dancing. Okay. It's 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 not stage performance. It's every every move has a potential of defense and counterattack. So it's a it's a legitimate staff skill, but it's not presented in any way that you're going to break your legs immediately if you swing it wrong because you're not moving super fast yet. Anyway, so that's up and it will continue to grow. And that's, yeah, that's the weapon. That is the weapon that I feel every Jedi should use because it's it's what we are. It's a defensive weapon. It's not meant to hurt, it's not meant to break, it's not meant to kill. If, if I may, I would like to make an awareness that every single answer on this has been analogous in some way to the force itself. It comes from nature, it flows, it can create or destroy in the sense of the pen. Um, it is part of who we are, it's built into what we are. And I think we should also recognize that within all of this, that we're all innately hitting on the essence of what the force is as it moves through us in our selection of weapons. And I don't know that everyone watching would catch that without someone mentioning it. So I wanted to just put that out there real quick. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, as I've said a thousand times probably today, my goal is to, to be in harmony. And nothing combines a sword and a shield better than a staff. I, nothing I can, I can think of. Nothing that's been brought to my attention or invented. Of course, and, and I'm a guy who carries a gun for a living. Like, and that's, that's like the end game part of my force continuum. I, I work my way up to that, and I would prefer as a practitioner of this path to use uh, something that, that uh, marries the sword and the shield, both destructive and defensive, um, based on the intent of the user. So that's, that's why I love that weapon. Okay, I think uh, that's going to wrap it up for us. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the, uh, uh, our little addition to the Life uh, Reflection Day. Um, check out the Jedi Praxium, of course. Um, check out the Knights of Awakening. Check out uh, uh, International Federation of Chivalry Now. I'm just going to throw all these out here. What else? What else are we checking out? They can check out their local martial arts gym. Will be a good idea. <laughs> maybe uh, I, I I wish we had time to. Uh, maybe this can be something the four of us uh, and maybe we can get Andre in on the next one. H how to tell the difference between a McDojo and uh, a a good martial arts uh, school? Walk in um, and say McDojo and see who laughs and who gets upset. That's, pretty, that's, pretty good. that's true. That's actually you know, a good. Is this a, good, a McDojo when the guy gets mad at you? The answer is yes. That's a good. That that's that's probably the best way to do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, JediArts.site. Uh, Want to put that out there again? Incredible stuff that Miko is working on there. I highly recommend it. Um, you, even if you can't pick the form up very quickly initially. Once you familiarize yourself with the movements, you'd be surprised how much you can incorporate the staff into everything you're doing. So. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And uh, until next time, awaken the night within. <laughs>